I do a Western? No. Gonna do a Western? Yeah. So, Western blots are a really useful tool in biochemistry to detect if a specific protein is present in a sample. But they take a long time and I don't like that. So this is going to be an overview of our basic protocol. So basically we're gonna break these cells open, we call this lysis. We're gonna separate the proteins by their size, um, but we're gonna do this in a gel. Um, and so in order to actually test if certain proteins are there, we're gonna to need to get it onto something sturdier. So we take those proteins out of the gel. This is the actual blot part. We put them onto a membrane. Um, and then we use antibodies, which is little proteins that are going to specifically recognize proteins that we're looking for. Um, and there's a bunch of more boring parts in between all these to make sure that we don't have too much background signal so we don't get a bunch of noise and that we're only seeing the proteins that we want to see. So at the end of the day, we have this mix of proteins that we start with. And at the end, we're going to be able to see um, bands on this gel that are going to correspond to just the proteins that we want to look for. So if that protein is there, we should see a band. Um, and if the protein is not there, we shouldn't see a band. We should see a stronger band if there's more of the protein there. Weaker band if there's less of the protein there. But there's going to be a lot of other proteins there as well. We're just not going to see them because we're not looking for them. And so Western blotting, you know, one of the important things to remember is that you're looking for specific things. So you're only going to see what specific things that you're looking for. And so you need to know what you want to look for um, in order to look for it. And it's not going to tell you anything about the purity. Okay, so how does it work though? So we need, first we need to do this SDS part. Well, we need to lyse the cells. So we need to break them open. And often this is done with some sort of um, buffer solution. So this a buffer is just like a pH stabilized salt water. And you typically this lysis buffer will have some sort of detergent in it. Um, so detergent, um, it's like an artificial soap and it's gonna help break open those cells um, so that all the proteins can flow out. Um, and then we're, but the proteins are still all folded up. And so we need to actually use a different detergent. We're gonna use SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate. What this is going to do is a couple things. It's going to help denature or unfold the proteins along with heat. We heat up the sample. So we mix it with this buffer, this SDS page loading buffer that has SDS as well as like a, um, a loading dye and, um, then we heat it up and this is going to help unfold the protein and what the SDS does is it's going to slither all over the protein and it's going to help keep that protein unfolded but soluble. So we want to keep it soluble so that it's going to be able to flow through this gel. Um, and so the reason why the SDS can do this is so SDS is a detergent. It has this long hydrophobic part, this water avoided part. Apologies for the video quality. I don't like have a microphone or anything. I just use my headphones and one of my headphones were having problems. So I tried other headphones and I think those were even worse. So there's some serious sound quality issues throughout. I tried to re-record some of it, but I re-recorded it while walking to work. So you, then you get the wind and cars honking and things like that. Um, but hopefully you can make out what I'm saying um, and hopefully the graphics help. And sorry about this, I do this all for free. Um, so just doing what I can. It's going to add on to the hydrophobic parts of the protein and then this hydrophobic water um, loved head. So it's got this negatively charged head. And what it's going to do is the protein, the reason why it folds up this way is because it's going to hide basically the hydrophobic parts of the protein are going to kind of cluster up in the middle of the protein because the water doesn't want to hang out with them so they'll be avoided. Um, this causes the protein to fold up like this where it protects those hydrophobic regions. The SDS, the hydrophobic regions of SDS are going to kind of pop onto the protein once those regions are exposed. This is going to protect them um, from the protein just like globbing together. So not globbing to the SDS instead of just like globbing to other proteins that are unfolded and then you get these clumps that won't do anything. The SDS is able to keep it soluble because it's got those hydrophilic heads, those water loving parts, and so the water is still going to hang out with it. These negatively charged heads are also going to give this protein a uniform negative charge. And this charge is going to allow us to use electricity to send this protein swimming through a gel towards a positive charge. So this is the part of the acrylamide gel electrophoresis part. Um, this is going to allow them to separate by size. Um, and so this is when we're going down. Um, we're going down this gel, this SDS page gel. What's going to happen is that this gel is made up of this gel mesh, 
And basically the longer proteins are going to get triangled up more in this mesh as they're traveling through, so they're gonna travel slower. So they all have that negative charge. They're gonna be um, attracted to the positive charge at the bottom, but the longer ones are gonna go slower. So when you turn off the electricity, you, know, you turn off that, you remove that charge that's getting them to go through the gel. Well, now um, they're gonna be stuck and the bigger ones are gonna be stuck up higher, but you're not going to see them um, because there is, um, because they're invisible. But what you could be able to see is if you're using a pre-stained ladder. I typically like to use these pre-stained ladders when I'm doing a Western, um, so I can better see if things are transferred and visualize where the different size bands are. And so those pre-stained ladders you would be able to see. In the other cases, your proteins would be there, but you just wouldn't be able to see them. Okay, so yeah, so you'll have something like this. If you were to use like a chromacy stain or some other total protein stain, what you would see was a band corresponding to all of the proteins in the gel. But for a Western blot, you're only going to see the specific protein that you're looking for. And you're not going to see it before you do a bunch of other steps. So let's get into those steps. Um, but yeah, just to, so just to clarify, the SCS page, if you did like a chromacy stain, you'd see something like this. And the Western blot is at the end, you'd see something like this. We're only seeing a specific band um, of the protein that you were looking for. So basically, you can see that the proteins are like in here, but they're in this gel that's not very, first of all, if anything, you try to do anything, they could rip. The proteins, although there's not that positive charge anymore. It's kind of like getting them to drive toward through the gel. Um, and directionally, these proteins can still kind of wiggle around and they can diffuse out of the gel. And so, or they can diffuse like a lens if you cause that to get so all blurry and move and you don't work that. So basically you need to put these proteins onto something that is more stable. Um, so we're going to stick them onto a membrane. Um, and so this is often like a nitrocellulose or PDF or something membrane. Um, and this is going to, this membrane is going to be sturdier. It's going to allow us to do a bunch of washes um, and not have to worry about the proteins like moving out, not having to worry about ripping the gel, all of those great stuff. And so we're going to move it to this membrane in this blot step. There are different ways that you can do this blot. Um, and so like the conventional way, this is like a wet method um, where you're doing it in a tank. There are also like semi-dry methods as well as like fully dry methods. Um, so I've only in the past used this tank method, this like wet blot. Um, but today I'm drawing out this like turbo blot, which is like this dry method and it does it really fast. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that. But anyway, cause this can take like an hour plus um, to do this transfer. And the transfer time is going to depend too on what size of proteins that you're wanting to get out. So the bigger proteins are going to take longer, but then if you go too long, then the smaller ones can actually go through the membrane. Um, yeah, it's a whole big deal. Okay, but I think that's why you have you want your pre-stained ladder so that you're able to see if the transfer happened efficiently and whether all the proteins are going to get transferred onto the membrane. Um, so when you have this transfer, you should see the latter, all of the proteins are going to get transferred onto the membrane, um, and you don't want to still see those stained ladder bands in your gel. Um, so speaking of that gel, this is basically what it looks like when you have this, make this like sandwich where you have your gel and then you have your membrane and then you have these filter papers and these sponges and stuff, helping keep things nice and snug because this is the wet method. We want to keep everything wet so that you have the electricity can transfer things. Um, so in this like electrotransfer transfer sandwich, um, basically, yeah, those, so you have your paid shell, which has your proteins for now. And then you have your membrane um, where you want things to go. And then you have your filter papers um, to help keep things wet and the buffer through where the sponges for the snugness. And all of this gets kind of like wrapped up in this nice little cassette thing that you can then stick into the tank. Um, and so now instead of going down, we're going out, we're going out of the gel. Um, and it's important that you set things up so that you have it when the power is, the electricity is going to make it go out of the gel and onto the membrane. I'm going to make sure that you have it in the right direction so that you're not going from the, I'm not going from the gel onto the sponge. And so make sure that you set up these correctly. If you're doing this with one of these like bio rod tanks, you want to make sure that the gel is closer to 
on the black side and then the membrane is closer to um, the clear side. Um, and then you put that in, orient it into the tank so that the blackest side is by the black um, side of the tank. Okay, so then you're gonna fill it up, um, hook it up and power it on. And so now this is gonna go and when it finishes, you should have your proteins transferred over to the membrane. You should be able to see the ladder got transferred if you're using one of those pre-stained ladders, but you're not gonna be able to see those proteins that are present, um, the proteins that you want. And that is when you want um, to do the question in order to actually see those proteins. And um, okay, so in order to detect them, we're going to use antibodies. Um, so, and we'll get back into how we're going to first though, do some washes and blocking and stuff. Um, but first let's just talk about why, like what these antibodies are. Um, so antibodies are these little proteins that are going to recognize specific other proteins um, or other things that doesn't have to be a protein, but basically they have these generic parts, these like handles and then these unique parts because unique parts can recognize unique things um, from like, parts of other proteins or parts of things like that. And so in our bodies, basically we have these immune cells and they make these little parts of these variable regions. And then we test it out to see if they bind various things um, and the ones that bind things that are foreign, um, but don't bind things that are like our own bodies. And so we can ignore and this is how we make these um, specific antibodies, so cells that make those, um, then we make more of those and you stock up and this sort of thing. Um, we can also make antibodies in the lab against various different things, um, and these can be different types that we'll get into later, but this is just the basics of like what an antibody is. It is going to be this little protein that's going to specifically recognize, um, recognize things of interest, and so we can get antibodies that are going to specifically recognize the proteins that we're looking for. Um, and so these antibodies are going to have, like I said, this constant region, and this is going to be constant for a specific species. It's going to come into play later. So you would say, like, if this antibody was made in a rabbit, it would be a rabbit antibody, and then it would have this variable region um, where you have these antigen binding sites. So the thing that the antibody binds to is going to be like an antigen, um, and different antigens will recognize and bind to different parts or of uh, different molecules, and these parts that they bind to are called them epitopes. Um, there are different, as we'll get into later, there are different choices that we're going to have to choose when you're doing a Western blot. Um, and these involve like whether you want polyclonal antibodies, which will have a mix of different antibodies that all recognize the same protein, but different epitopes on that protein, so like different parts of the protein. So in the case of where's Waldo, it might recognize his hat and its boot um, and its elbow. And if you have like a polyclonal mix, whereas a monoclonal, you just have one of these, and so it's only recognizing a specific part. And we'll get into later some of the pros and cons of monoclonal versus polyclonal mix like that. Um, but first, let's go back to um, our blot. Um, so basically, we want to use antibodies in order to recognize that protein of interest. There are a couple of challenges. So one of them is that we have to be able to detect the thing. So if we were to just basically bind the antibody onto a protein, but it's just like a normal antibody, there's no way to actually see it. Um, so it doesn't work in this very much. We're labeled to make it visible with something else that's visible. We want to label something that's visible or at least something that we can make visible. There are a couple of strategies to do this. Um, and so we're gonna have to use some sort of labeled antibody. So these antibodies are gonna be like conjugated or like attached to some sort of label. These labels can be fluorescent. Um, so you shine light at them and they'll put up light at a different wavelength. Um, they can be chemical in essence where you have some sort of chemical reaction um, or you can have some sort of like conjugation. A common thing is like horseradish peroxidase. But basically, you add this chemical and then it makes this orangish prod brown product that you can measure. Often these are attached though to a secondary antibody rather than to a primary antibody. So the primary antibody is going to be the antibody that directly binds to the protein of interest in your gel. But there could be multiple proteins of interest. Uh, like everybody's looking for like different proteins of interest often. Um, and so if you had to buy a special version of that antibody, 
that has conjugated, those would be really, really expensive. And so instead, what you can do is you can use a secondary antibody that's more like generic. And the secondary antibody, what it's going to do is it's going to recognize the generic part of the primary antibody. So the secondary antibody is going to bind to the primary antibody, which is bound to your protein of interest. This is a couple of good things in addition to saving you money because now you can, well, you have to buy a second antibody. But these secondary antibodies are going to be cheaper because a lot, a lot of people are going to want these um, because they can be used with a bunch of different primary antibodies. And so these are going to be cheaper. And so you can use the same secondary antibody for a lot of different primary antibodies as long as they have that same generic region. The generic region is going to be specific for the animal that made it. So you would have like a rabbit antibody. And then the secondary would be like anti-rabbit. This could be made like a goat anti-rabbit or something. And then you could have a rabbit anti-goat or various things. So basically you just have to have the secondary antibody has to be able to recognize the species specific part of the primary antibody. So this could be rats, this could be rabbit, this could be goat, various different ones. Um, and then the secondary one is going to recognize that. So in addition to saving you money because you don't have to buy like a special version of your primary, you can also, um, this allows for signal amplification. So basically if you had a single protein, a single antibody binding, then you would only be able to have like a single signal per, per antibody that was bound. But the secondary antibodies, they can bind to, multi, you can have multiple secondary antibodies bound to this primary antibody. And this is going to allow you to increase the signal. You can have multiple signals per primary antibody, so multiple signals per protein that's there. Another way to increase signal we'll talk about later is using polyclonal antibodies, which might be able to recognize multiple sites on the protein, so you can have multiple of these primaries. And then if you couple that with the, with the secondaries, you can get even further amplification. But you can also have sense, um, like specificity problems with polyclonal, so we'll get that later. Okay, and I'm going to dig in for some of the like, housekeeping genes, some of the things that you might be doing um, for like, saying old vaccination. So often there's a protein that you're looking for, but you want to kind of be able to say, okay, if I want to test if that protein is kind of like one of those single samples, I need to make sure that I'm loading the same total amount of like cell lysis or thing. So you often are going to look for a different gene. So also like the health point you use and it could in a tube line that should have three plus levels throughout the health cell. And so then so for that, you're able to then kind of normalize the levels between different samples, make sure that you're loaded the same amount in each of these different lanes. Um, if they're slightly different, you might be able to normalize to the amount of signal of that active or tube or whatever you were looking for. And because so many people are going to use those same ones, you can often get them already conjugated to a label of the same time. Um, and typically, because these proteins are more highly expressed, on this one, you don't have to worry as much about the amplification. So often, you'll get some sort of um, antibodies. You can have like an anti tubulin antibody that's already conjugated to a fluorescent um, thing or something. Another thing to keep in mind that was when you're using these fluorescents, you want to make sure that you are using different wavelengths so that they're not going to overlap if you're doing multiplexing. So if you're trying to use multiple antibodies at the same time, you need to make sure that they're from different species. If you're doing the secondary antibody against the primary, then you need to make sure that the, um, they have different wavelengths. Okay. So those, that's the basics of the antibodies, but we don't want to just add them directly because we're going to get antibodies that are going to just bind to a bunch of places on the gel, and then we're going to get to the background. Um, so we want these antibodies to bind specifically to our protein and not just to the, um, to the gel membrane. So remember that when we transfer it onto this membrane, we just first because it's hard for getting our protein system. But there's a bunch of empty regions on the membrane because when we our, our gel isn't just like chock full of proteins. Like it's got protein, a ton of proteins in each of these different lanes. Um, and one of the great things about the Westerners is it's not just going to show us all blur, blur of, of like sludge. sludge. Um, if we have a little bit of one protein, we're actually going to be able to see that. But 
in between those smudges of domains that you would see, there would be a bunch of empty space. Since that empty space is going to be empty space on the membrane, and this membrane remembers kind of like duct tape for proteins, and so it's going to there's not protein there. Well, then these antibodies, well, these antibodies are proteins, um, and so this they can stick to the gel to the membrane. It's not specific to the um, and so what we do is we block those regions of the membrane that don't have protein on them. We block them with the generic protein. This is going to prevent flyback. Um, so we want to block it with something really boring so that it's almost like it wasn't there at all. Um, we don't want it to our, basically we want to kind of blunt that stickiness of the stick plate so that we'll really be able to bond to the protein. Um, so you want what do you use for this? There's different choices. Um, so often what we use is we actually use milk, like that free milk, and get milk powder and mix it slightly. And which is kind of just a generic protein. And um, we don't want your antibody. Um, we want to use like a positive control to make sure that if you don't see the signal, it's because the protein is not there, not because the antibody doesn't recognize it. So antibodies can have varying levels of quality, and so you want to make sure that your antibody is good quality. It is actually recognizing your protein of interest. You also want to make sure it's not just recognizing a bunch of other proteins, so you want it to have high specificity. Um, in terms of, and then in terms of the blocking, um, so you want to you often use milk, um, but you don't want to use that if you're detecting fossil proteins because the milk, the main protein in this milk that we're taking advantage of is casein, um, which is highly phosphorylated, and so we don't want to be messing with that. Um, or when you're using biotin to detect just so it's not great for that. So the blocking we're trying to like decrease the background signal in terms of just binding to the binding to like the membrane. But we also need to worry about binding to other proteins. So when we when we're talking about like in the milk case, another reason why even if you're not using a phosphorylation specific um, detection system, milk has a bunch of other proteins. So when you're using BSA, you have like a single protein. When you're using milk, you have a ton of different proteins. Some of these proteins might confuse your antibody, and then the antibody can bind to that. Um, the antibody could also bind to other proteins in the gel that aren't your protein of interest, but that happen to kind of look like it. So this is more of a risk if you have a polyclonal antibody mix. So basically this is a mix, remember, of different antibodies that are all recognizing different parts of that same protein. How these antibodies are typically made is they you can inject an animal with something that you want to act as an antigen, or an antigen is the thing that the antibody recognizes. And then the antibody, the animal is going to make a bunch of antibodies, and these antibodies are going to be mix antibodies that are going to recognize different parts of the parts of that protein, um, different isotopes on that antigen, but they're all going to recognize that. And so when you use purification methods to try to separate out all of the antibodies that recognize the antigen, so you can say, okay, let's take the protein of interest and we're just going to like pull out all those antibodies that stick to it and we stick them in a tube and sell it to you. That's basically a polyclonal mix. So in addition to having extended antibodies stronger, it's weaker, like it comes to binding different parts, they can also have a higher risk of also binding other things. But you have the advantage that because you're binding multiple places, you're going to have a higher potential sensitivity as well as it's going to be cheaper, typically. Um, for the monoclonal, what happens is you only have a single antidote. These are typically more expensive to make because they have to go through more steps in order to find the cells that need those in those good antibodies, find the cells on the cells that need those antibodies, and then get them to make more of them. So they're often more expensive, and you're going to get a lower signal. You have that, it's, you could still have problems with cross reactivity um, if it that, that one really good one also binds to other things. Um, so that's the basics of the antibody choice when you're doing a Western blot. 
So just to review with this Western blot, we are taking these cells, we're breaking them open. You don't have to start with cells. You can start with some like purified mixture or partially purified mixture. Um, you can detect things. We, and our goal is to detect like a specific protein or you can even detect specific modifications on various proteins. So you might have an antibody that recognizes a phosphorylated version of a protein or a glycosylated version of a protein when that has a specific sugar chain attached. Or maybe you have an antibody against the sugar chain. You can see where all of these, what proteins in the cell have this glycosylation. Um, so there are different types of antibodies, which brings me to another important point is that when you're doing a Western blot, we typically, when we're doing like SDS page, we're doing a denature and gel. So these proteins are unfolded. You need to make sure that the antibodies that you're binding are validated for Western blotting. They need to be able to recognize the unfolded state of the protein. Sometimes there are reasons why you would want to use an antibody that recognizes the full state of a protein. That's just if you're doing some sort of staining or tracking inside of cells where the protein is going to be nicely folded up. If there could be parts of the protein, um, it's more it's more of a problem trying to detect those folded up proteins with typically that with one of these um, with an antibody than the other way around um, because you're going to have more regions opened up and the antibody is only going to recognize a small part of the protein. And so it should be visible, but there are potentially like epitopes that can be only seen in good states. So the antibody might only recognize that specific part once it's folded up. Um, and so you need to make sure that the antibodies are able to recognize these proteins in their unfolded state. Um, you should be able to find that on the website for the antibody. Um, okay, so then you also, so we're gonna take those cells or whatever, we're gonna break them open if, if we need to. Then we're going to unfold all those proteins and coat them with this negatively charged SCS that's gonna keep them soluble and unfolded. And we're gonna let them swim through the gel, separating by size. Um, once they do that, we're gonna transfer them to a membrane. And then we're going to coat the membrane with a generic protein in order to block it. You can see that, voila, it was transferred. We don't want to like try to come back and stay in that membrane, but what you can do is this thing called a ponzo stain. Um, and it's kind of like reddish brown and it's quick and it's reversible. So you can put some on your membrane and it'll stain all of the protein. So you'll actually be able to see um, if things transferred, if you have roughly similar amounts of things. Um, if, yeah, just like if you're doing something to, like that, you can see kind of like the purity if it's a partially purified thing or something. Um, and then you can wash it off before you go and do your, um, do your blotting. Now it's like nothing was ever there. Well, almost. Just a couple minutes in the wash and the stain is almost completely gone. And then I can go block it. So you can do your block. Um, typically this is done for like an hour in, at room temp or you can do it overnight in the cold room depending on timing. And now you're going to be able to bring in your antibodies. Um, but, so you're going to start with that primary antibody. Typically, we actually we do this with the um, with the blocking agent still in it. Um, so we'll do so you have like your milk solution, um, your TBST milk solution with the blocking, um, or or your TBST with the BSA. And then you'll take some of that and you'll add your primary antibody to it. Um, and so you can look at the manufacturer's protocol and they'll tell you like what dilution it'll be, like a one to something ratio or whatever. And then you take a little bit of your antibody and you stick it in there. You, another note is that you can actually, after you do the primary antibody, you can pour that, um, that blocking solution plus your antibody into a tooth and actually keep that in the fridge um, for a while, it'll, it'll still work. Um, and then you can also like aliquot out little portions, single use portions of the antibodies so that you don't have to keep freeze-thawing them. Because remember those are little proteins and so they are fragile like proteins um, and proteins typically don't like to be freeze-thawed a bunch, so be nice to them. Okay, so now you do your primary antibody. Um, so we now you pour that off and but now you can't just pour it off and dump in your secondary. Instead, you have to do some washes. And the washes are basically uh, the reason why, the main reason why I hate Western blots. 
Um, so we're typically doing these washes with our TBFT, so our tris buffered saline with tween. Um, this tween is a detergent, um, so it's going to help us um, wash things off that are not stuck, stuck super stuck. Um, so we want to get rid of anything that's just kind of like hanging around there. And so if our antibody, say it binds really strongly to our protein of interest, but it binds weakly to other proteins or just to that whatever blocking protein is on the, on the membrane, we need to remove it. Um, we also need to remove whatever just didn't get poured off because you know there's always a little liquid left over whenever you try to pour anything. So we need to get rid of that extra um, primary antibody and the primary antibody that's not bound where it, only where it should be bound. Because remember, the secondary antibody, it's not recognizing our protein, it's going to be recognizing the primary antibody, assuming we're using the secondary antibody strategy, um, but the same principle still holds if you're doing it, you're prim just a primary antibody that's already labeled, you want that label to just be where you want it. So we need to remove any excess primary antibody uh, regardless. So we're going to do that um, TBST, um, and typically you do like three 10-minute washes um, with some gentle agitation on an orbital shaker. Um, so in terms of like incubation time with the primary antibody, it's typically um, often you do a little longer with the primary antibody, so like two hours or overnight in the cold room. And again, uh, look at the protocols for the various antibody you got. Some of them are have slightly different, um, depending on how good the antibodies are and things like that. Um, and then you want, to, then you do your washes, and now you can bring in the secondary antibody. And so when you bring in the secondary antibody, typically this is just like an hour, um, and then you can wash it off before you visualize it. It's really important that you wash it off because remember that's the thing you're looking for, and so you want to make sure that the thing you're looking for is only where it should be. So it's only bound to the primary antibody. If you are doing something where you don't, if you have just like a direct um, conjugation to your primary, um, then you do the washes still after the primary and then you can visualize. But if you do the secondary, you do the secondary, then you do your like three more washes and then you can do your visualization. Um, and so, yes, that's the basics of Western blobbing. And before I leave, I just want to say that Western blobbing is only one form of blobbing. Um, and there's a lot of other forms of blobbing, and you can learn more about them in other posts. But basically, Western blobbing is actually the W should be um, lowercase because it, it does not stand for a name. Southern stands for a name. So, Southern blob is like the original blob, and it looks for DNA using um, labeled DNA instead of looking for proteins, which is what the Western block does. So the Southern block was named for this guy at Southern who came up with the technique. So it gets a capital S with all these other like one of these, they technically have to lowercase. So it's kind of a lowercase W, but people don't really, well, uh, that won't be mad at you. I assume I was like mess up and put a capital W as well. Um, there's also the Northern block, which looks for RNA using DNA. And there's a bunch of other different types that look for different things using different things. Uh, more about that in other posts. Uh, today, I just wanted to focus on the and we'll do the actual um, So, I hope that helps. And good luck with your experience.